Hi, everyone. For today's uh, Jazz Ideas episode, I wanted to post a Facebook Live discussion I did about a month ago on Alex Terrier's uh, music page. And uh, in this discussion, we cover a lot of the approaches I use to practice with my book, Box Shapes. So there's a lot of content in there. It's upwards of 40, 45 minutes long. Uh, I apologize for the video quality since it was a Facebook live stream, but I think there's still a lot of good information in here uh, for you to check out. And there are files that you can download to follow along, which I mentioned in the lecture. Uh, and I will post that in the description of the video here on YouTube and also on my blog. Uh, and then you'll be able to download free PDFs for all the content that's mentioned. A lot of it is coming from the A minor flute partita and the toccata and fugue. So this is stuff that I'm working on for the next volume of the book it includes more minor key ideas and patterns and things like that and how to practice them including outlining which i've mentioned before uh, and various ideas plus i take a few questions so enjoy the discussion and please do subscribe if you want to follow more of these lesson videos uh, i hope to make some new ones next week and i will see you soon hi everybody <laughs> i see alex and i are uh, speaking from the same voice right now but um I'm just uh, typing a few links, uh, and it looks like um, Alex is here as well. I'm just typing in a few links that could help during this uh, talk about my book. Um, I created a few handouts uh, that you are welcome to download for free if you go to my blog, which I just typed in. Um, and please let me know if you can hear me clearly. I'm testing out all this stuff, not for the first time, but for the first time on Facebook Live. Um, so what did I want to say? Uh, thank you. Uh, you can download the PDFs and it would help. I'm going to share my screen a little bit, but I'd like to not share my screen too much during the talk. So if you want to go ahead and click on the PDF links in the link I just posted under blog, uh, please do. And I will be taking questions. I don't want to keep this too formal. I do have a lot of stuff to talk about because I'm into this material and I tend to talk too much. Um, so uh, I want to open it up to questions at any time I can see the comment my computer is a little bit far away but I can definitely read your comments um, so please ask any questions at any time um, so welcome I guess it is one o'clock now so I'll start officially let me put my keyboard down here and get a saxophone I want to thank Alex Terrier for letting me do this on his site that is awesome uh, I don't do Facebook lives ever. This is actually the first one I've ever done. I have been teaching a lot on Zoom and uh, other platforms since this started, but uh, it's fun to do a Facebook thing for once. So thanks. I'm glad so many people are joining. Uh, hey, Luke. Hey, Ollie. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, again, yeah. So if uh, you can share this, that would be great. I am going to do a raffle sort of thing where at the end of the 45 minutes, 50 minutes, I will pick somebody that shared it uh, to send them a free PDF of the first book. So what I'm doing here today is mostly talking about what I'm working on towards box shapes too. And I'm sure most of you don't even know what box shapes is, uh, especially if you're Alex's students, uh, this may be totally new for you. Uh, my friends may be familiar with it, but uh, two years ago I did this book for saxophone, uh, you can read all about it on boxshapes.com, the other link I posted with uh, commentary from other musicians and some links to some of the material. Um, here it is. Um, and I wrote it for saxophone, but it's really for all instruments. And it's a bunch of scale sequences, so scale patterns, essentially, um, but all taken and referenced from specific Bach pieces. Um, mainly the violin partitas, which I have here, um, and a couple other sources, the flute sonatas, things like that. People uh, are probably familiar with a lot of that music. Um, what I'm doing now, this book came out in 2017, so I was working on it from like 2012 to 2016. Uh, and before that, I had a group that I started to play Baroque music with. I'm a jazz saxophonist, as many of you know, but at some point, for some reason, I got really into Baroque music, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, really wanted to play it and I didn't really have an outlet for that because I didn't know any classical musicians so nobody wanted to play it with me uh, so I started forming groups and little informal readings playing reading through Bach and Telemann and all those guys um, so that kind of led to this eventually just listening to tons of Baroque music for a little stretch back in the early 10s or t 2011 or so 
and that resulted in a record uh, that I did with Ryan Ferreira and Chris Tordini, um, where it's uh, kind of a more ambient take on a lot of early music, Handel, uh, Dowland, Bach, uh, and that was really fun to do. Uh, it's volume one. We never got around to volume two, even though we played a whole other set of music. Maybe we'll get back to it someday. Uh, we did do a couple gigs last year, so maybe it'll be back. But um, that you can see, I don't know if these links are in reverse behind me, but uh, using my chalkboard wall here, Luce Trio, bandcamp.com, L-U-C-E. You can listen to the whole record for free on there. Um, so anyway, as I was listening to Bach, I something that everyone notices in his music is all the diatonic sequences. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, it could be anything really basic version. You know, something. Anything really basic like that, uh, up to the really complicated. So what the book does in the first book is I ordered it in order of difficult to, uh, harder and a lot of times harder doesn't mean technically harder but harder to transpose by ear and this book has it all in all keys because i was not just targeting jazz musicians sometimes you get those books um a lot of books for jazz musicians specifically where they give you an idea once on one line of a book uh and you're expected to transpose it which is great you should definitely do that but I find when I flip through those books, I tend to just do that. I tend to flip through those books and play that one line and not bother transposing it. So I decided, you know, I was weighing both options in this book to transpose it out in all keys. And a lot of that comes from the fact that I've been playing a lot of clarinet, a lot of classical clarinet in the last few years. And you read through books like the Behrman scale book and everything's all in every key. And you can kind of mark each key you're working on. And I kind of liked that. Um, so for me, a lot of this material is relevant to my doubling playing, my clarinet my flute, um, even more so than saxophone, even though I published the book in saxophone range, because that's the most conservative. I figured everyone could read that range. Uh, I practice a lot of the stuff on clarinet where getting across the break and stuff really makes a difference. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today uh, is what I'm working on for the next book, which is going to have a lot more stuff in it. And honestly, I had not been working on it for the last few months because I didn't have time. I teach a college class or two at City College of New York, uh, and I teach some private students and just day-to-day -day life. So I wasn't working on the book for a little while, but one of the benefits of having all this time at home is I've started working on it again in the last couple weeks. And that includes transposing the whole, or uh, rewriting the entire first book for bass clef. I'm almost done with that. That was something I had been meaning to do for a long time. So that'll be available maybe next week in PDF. Um, and also uh, working on the next book, which I want to be much bigger. This book, as you can see, is like 60 pages, 70 pages. Um, the next book is going to be more of a compendium. So I have some of these diatonic type patterns. Uh, I have some diminished kinds of patterns. I have some circle of fifths dominance kind of patterns. Uh, and then I'm getting more creative and working things into tunes, um, how to use them in your jazz playing a little more specifically. And if you want to see more about that, I've already done a few articles for the... Uh, best sax site ever. Maybe somebody can find that while I'm talking uh, and share the link. But otherwise, you can see them all linked to on boxshapes.com or my website. Uh, I did a few articles on how Paul Desmond uses this because a lot of this stuff reminds me of the Paul Desmond Brubeck counterpoint that they used to do. And I do a lot of counterpunt, uh, contrapuntal playing with my fellow musicians when we play gigs, too. It's nice to kind of play together. And a lot of that comes from uh, studying with Lee Konitz for a good stretch um, who did that all the time with Warren Marsh. So the Tristano School has a say here too, even though um, he maybe never specifically used these kinds of Bach type patterns, but definitely the ethos of uh, contrapuntal playing is there. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is something specific that I'm working on for the new book, which is I'm taking one piece at a time and just seeing how much I can get out of it. So the piece I've been working on lately is the A minor flute partita, probably one of uh, his most famous pieces for winds at least it's the only unaccompanied flute sonata or flute partita um and it is in a minor and the great thing about these monophonic pieces so meaning for violin which is not technically monophonic but monophonic oriented meaning one note at a time uh and flute pieces is that he really outlines chords and melodies in interesting ways because you can't play chords, you can't play all these notes at the same time. 
So it's all about how he navigates the harmony in a single line format. And this is one of the best pieces for that. So I just want to talk about a couple specific spots. I will share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't know the piece, I was going to play you a little bit. I know Luke knows it. Uh, I was going to play you a little bit of uh, Emmanuel Pahoud playing it, but I just saw that Facebook is taking down videos that might share, uh, you know, released recordings. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, and I don't know the whole thing by heart, so I'm not going to play the whole thing for you. But it's the one that goes like this. Make sure my G sharp's not sticking. <laughs> So that's just the beginning of it, and it goes on like that. Um, so I'm going to break down, uh, with your permission, hopefully this is interesting to you, I'm going to break down a bunch of spots just from the first page of the published uh, manuscript of this Allemande, which is the first section uh, of the um, Bach A minor flute partita. And you can do this with any Bach piece. Part of the fun of working on this book is I can just grab you know, the well-tempered clavier, uh, any of my Bach binders down here of music and just look for sequences like this and see what I can do with them to make them an interesting thing to practice. And it is relevant to jazz musicians and it's also relevant just for woodwind technique because it's all about intervals and ear training. Um, so the first spot, let me try this uh, share screen thing. Actually, do I know how to do that? Maybe I don't. One moment. Well, I don't see it handy on my screen right now where it formerly was. Thank you, Luke. Fill in the time there. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, okay. I'll just play it. Um, so if you do have the link above, please use that. You can see what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a handout, johndelucia.com slash blog. It's the latest blog post I posted. So while you're watching, please uh, look at those. So I want to talk about this first pattern uh, that I heard. Actually, the first one is that arpe arpeggiated chord, but we'll talk about that later. The next thing that happens that's of interest is this. <laughs> And then it goes somewhere else because, of course, in a piece of music, these things don't stay around for very long. So part of what I'm trying to do with this book is have you stick on one section of box music for a little while to work on it technically, work on tuning, uh, which for me, I'm playing a new Wonder 2 now uh, for the last few months. So still getting used to the tuning on this horn. It's a great way to get familiar with an instrument that you haven't been playing for a while. Uh, so the new Wonder, it's, it's not an out-of-tune instrument, but it's flexible. So I, I have to be extra careful with my tuning. Uh, so part of it is that. Uh, and then technically, I might take a phrase like this, and in the handout, I moved it up chromatically. Uh, where did it go? Et cetera, et cetera. So you could just go through it like that and find any technical mishaps. One of the things that's good to do with these looping type sections like this um, is do something that uh, is called outlining. I don't know if anybody's heard of the great music teacher of the 20th century, Abby Whiteside, uh, and her student, Sophia, Sophia Rosoff, uh, that a lot of pianists studied with in the city um, passed this teaching on. Uh, she has a couple great books that are worth checking out. Uh, and she does something called outlining with a difficult te technical passage. I'm sure some of you guys have heard some other ideas for working with something like swinging the eighth notes. <laughs> and then reversing it. So that, that works too. This is another idea where you just take the downbeats or the strong beats and play them in a loop. And kind of build your rhythm there for a while. And then you start to fill in the missing notes. And you could even start this at a fast tempo. This is what's nice about this. This is not a metronome practice. This is something you do to internalize your own sense of time. And when 
whenever you feel like you're, the time is getting away from you, you go back to the basic beat. So this is a great phrase for working on stuff like that. And you can really do it quite fast. I don't know how fast I can do it right now. I'm still working on this stuff myself. <laughs> Etc. Etc. So you can really get your speed going in a fast way, and your time—you'll be amazed at how even everything can be. You could even fill in uh, more than just four notes at a time. You could break it down even further to, you know, just fill in the last note before the downbeat, or two notes before the downbeat. <laughs> that's that's a pretty fun one. Um, so any of those methods of breaking down a phrase like that. So that this is just measure three of the Bach A minor flute partita. And I'm finding something I can dig into for a while. And if you want to relate this to jazz, it's a one to five pattern in A minor. So I'm hearing A minor, I'm hearing E7 or E7 flat nine or G sharp diminished or whatever variation you want to call that. So I'm already hearing some Charlie Parker type ideas. He'll always do that kind of movement from G sharp up to F. <laughs> It just gets good ideas in my head. I'm not really trying to swing Bach. I am a little bit in the beginning. But the idea is, uh, the reason I made this book is not a point A to point B method book on how to play Bach on jazz. A lot of people have taken it that way, so I followed up with uh, articles to that effect. But um, it's meant to spark creativity. So for me, listening to Bach, and there's this great Coleman Hawkins quote, I'll read you, that was the part of the inspiration for uh, book two, for me keeping going with this. Uh, I'll read it since I can't find my share screen option. Uh, Coleman Hawkins, if they think they are doing something new, they ought to do what I do every day, spend at least two hours every day listening to Johann Sebastian Bach. And man, it's all there. If they want to improvise on a theme, which is the essence of jazz, they should learn from the master. He never wastes a note, and he knows where every note is going and when to bring it back. Some of these cats go way out and forget where they began or what they started to do. Bach will clear it up for them. So, you know, that's it. It's just like you're hearing good connection between chords. So here I'm just connecting one to five. And if you are looking at the handout, this is example two, by the way. I skipped example one. This is, uh, we're starting on example two. Um, and if you're new to the group, uh, please do share it. Like I said earlier, if you share it, I, I will be able to see who shared it, and I'll send somebody a free PDF. If not two, I'm leaning towards two free PDFs, but you know, we'll save that for uh, a little bit later in the talk. I'll be doing that around quarter of. Um, and first of all, I hope you're all well in this situation. Just to interrupt myself for a second, uh, we, me, and my wife are doing fine. We're bunkered down here in uh, Brooklyn, and we're doing okay. Uh, and if you want to chime in and just tell me what instruments you play, too, I'd be curious to hear what you guys play. Um, and so I can maybe tailor this to different instruments a little bit. Because uh, like I said, I wrote the book for saxophone just to give myself a set of parameters, but it's great for other instruments as well. Um, so moving on to the next example, uh, going back to example one in the handout, if you have it, if you don't, go up and follow the link at the beginning of the comments and you'll see it. Um, these are the kinds of patterns I use for book one, is these diatonic patterns just moving up and down a scale. So the one from the Bach A minor flute partita that I like in the first two or three lines is this. And then it moves up. And that's it. So he moves on after a couple iterations, like all of box music does. He's not going to make it too predictable. But for practice sake, we are making it predictable. We're just putting it in one key. And that means you can apply it in various situations. You can work on it in new keys. So the benefit of doing this is, again, maybe three or four fold. I'm tuning my intervals, which is always a challenge. So I take the lowest uh, of the group and the highest of each group and tune those first. <laughs> a third so that this the first iteration of the pattern reaches up or a third or a tenth or um whatever um so i'm making sure those are in tune and then i'm just filling in the notes in between <laughs> And this is a nice sort of like major six chord kind of pattern, or you could think of it as C, 
moving to A minor, D minor, B diminished, E minor, C. So it's kind of a scale moving uh, triads and scales. <laughs> You know, it's getting that kind of harmony going, but in a unique shape. So what do I do with this? I practice it, maybe read it first, like I am now. <laughs> Trying to take note of the interval structure. It's a little more interesting than doing... <laughs> just playing thirds or just playing fourths. Um, it's something harder to remember. So as you transpose it, which I'll do next, I try and move this to the key of F, and the best way to do this is by ear. I'll put it in the book in the key of F as well, and you could also change it to minor, but uh, then I need to think about where does it start? It starts on the third, and then I need to think about the interval structure, which is a little irregular. It's not just going up in thirds or up in fourths. And here's the hardest part is finding that note when I drop down. And that connects me to the next uh, scale degree. Oh. Et cetera, et cetera. And I can carry that on into altissimo. It's a great way of pre-hearing your intervals, um, which is, I think, the biggest benefit of doing this, is taking these keys, taking these difficult shapes, box shapes, uh, through different keys is really great for your ear. That's the biggest benefit for me, hands down. Whatever you do with it after that, um, for me it relates into what I do most of the time, which is not this, but it's learning tunes for gigs or just for my own enjoyment. So when I go to learn standards, I need to know what degree of the chord I'm starting on so I can remember it. So that way I can start on any note on the horn and play the tune for in that key. You know, once I without even getting intellectual on it. So I don't, I don't even want to think the first chord is E flat diminished or whatever. I kind of just want to hear the note moving to the next note. So I take a tune that's very intervallic, like Indian Summer. I don't know if anyone knows this tune. See, I already missed one. And another one. So I'm hearing, even in the key that I'm supposed to know this tune in, I'm trying to hear uh, all those big jumps, and sometimes I'm missing by one, sometimes I'm not. So it's the same thing working on these patterns. So if I try and take Indian Summer into another key, I'll do it in C major on the horn. Now I have to make a jump. feeling my way around tunes when I learn them in different keys. Same, uh, excuse me, same idea with the box shapes. I'm just trying to kind of feel it out going through different keys. So that's the biggest application to me of the diatonic type shapes, which you can get uh, a good 20 or so of from the first book. I advocate doing that. Uh, the next book will have, a, the first chapter will be just like the first book, but then it's going to go into other things. I might even put uh, duets and you can actually if you go to my website there's free duets you can download that I wrote from the well-tempered clavier which I've never seen written out for woodwind duets and it's hard because a lot of those pieces have much more than two notes at a time going on so you have to find the ones that kind of work and hopefully I did uh, so please download those and play them with your friends and because the range is so high I mostly wrote them for different saxophones soprano and tenor alto and tenor um, I don't know if there are any questions so far. I'm going to keep plowing on. Uh, if you have the handout again, and I see uh, that I'm going to talk myself out of time, so I may um, skip around a little, excuse me, a little bit more. Um, so once you've gone through the diatonic sequences, played them in different keys, that's, you know, more than half the battle. That was the idea. Hopefully they'll give you some creative ideas uh, of intervallic shapes you can play over a tune. If you want to see at the end of the first book, there are four etudes that I wrote over standard changes. Uh, so you can see some of the ways I fit these patterns over tunes. So that might bring me to example three on the handout if you have it, um, which is uh, this kind of shape. I'll play it. And I wrote chord changes here if you, if you can see it. <laughs> And 
that's, you know, when you think of Paul Desmond and Bach, I think of these kinds of shapes. He does these all the time. And this is following a sequence of fourths, you know. And moving downwards diatonically like that, like Fly Me to the Moon, like Autumn Leaves. You can hear that motion uh, in so many tunes, and often those tunes get pinned as classical sounding whenever they use that. And that's because the Baroque era used tons of these kinds of sequences. Um, so once you see um, these kinds of sequences in play, a lot of people like All the Things You Are. Uh, what's another one? Throw them in the comments if you can think of more. Fly Me to the Moon, Autumn Leaves, maybe uh, Shadow of Your Smile. Often minor tunes use this kind of motion for sure. Um, so you can apply that directly. I mean, I, I could play this in a Paul Desmond kind of way, just as is almost. <laughs> etc etc it kind of takes me into that sort of tone just by playing the pattern a little bit so that's a very literal translation of what is on the page but you can also learn great voice leading from this kind of shape you can see he's carrying the G on the E minor to the G of the A minor G of the A minor to the F sharp of the D7 to the F sharp of the G major to the E of the C E of F sharp minor 7 flat 5 to D sharp so you're starting to hear that top note resolving with the notes of the chord changing underneath it a really useful thing in jazz improvisation so talking about that since i don't want to talk the whole time uh though i can't hear you guys talk so i guess i will be talking the whole time uh i take these kinds of patterns that he does on the second page of the handout um which is how the piece starts and then continues this is from the piece itself the a minor flute partita for those that are new new to the party here which again you can download at the top of the comments you can see the handout. So that's a, he's clearly moving from C to C dominant and voice leading it in a really nice way on a single note instrument. Um, so I take patterns like that and I've done this before I even started uh, the Bach thing as a project. Um, and I'll arpeggiate through a tune. So it's a little more fun than arpeggiating, like, say, Cherokee, which I've created something for you guys here, again, on that link. I just did the first A section. I know somebody's going to make me play the bridge. But uh, <laughs> for now, just the A section. Um, on Cherokee, it's more fun than doing this. <laughs> So instead of doing all the seventh chords in time, up and down, if you don't know how to do that, yeah, do that first for sure. Uh, but if you want to get more creative and try and turn it into an etude for yourself, uh, you can do these types, these Bach type arpeggiation patterns. And if you see the etude I wrote, uh, Partita Shape over Cherokee, you can see it. But I'll, I'll just play a little bit of it for you. I'll play the first one as written, and then I'll just do it improvisationally because it's actually not that important that you're deadly accurate with this. Um, it's more fun to just kind of feel your way through the tune, arpeggiate it in, in, a, in a vague resemblance of that shape. It doesn't need to be deadly accurate. The important things that are that you have time, that you keep it in time and try and get through it like you're playing it on a gig, um, even though this would be way more notes that I want to actually improvise. So here it is the way I wrote it. <laughs> So that's just one A section as written, but it's more fun to just not be reading music and obviously more productive to just hear your way through a tune. Thank <laughs> you. 
And the bed, I'll try the bridge. Take some thinking. But you find really cool ways of voice leading, meaning I'm not playing everything in root, posi uh, root position. I'm starting on the fifth of some chords. I'm starting on the third. I'm starting on whatever stays the closest. And if you've played any other Bach pieces like this, like the first, uh, what is it, the first prelude uh, from the keyboard pieces, uh, where he just arpeggiates, basically, a chord progression, You've seen that happen, and you've seen the cool ways that he just moves as little as possible. Um, so it's so relevant to us as improvisers, and that's what I think Coleman Hawkins was really talking about, was the ways of connecting chords. Uh, and again, it's not a literal thing. I didn't want to write a book of Bach licks to play on tunes. Uh, so you have to be creative with this stuff. You can not even deal with the jazz aspect. You can just work on these uh, and read through it and work on it with a metronome or without or do the outlining that I mentioned before and keep it just technical, uh, which is why I transpose the things for uh, musicians that want to do that. Uh, or you can make it a real ear exercise, or you can even try and put it into tunes. Um, another spot that he does this kind of thing, and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, the next sheet that I put in there is um, minor pattern from the A minor flute partita. This one, instead of going up chromatically, instead of going up in scales, I went around the circle of fifths. So you do one pattern in one key, and then move up a fifth, uh, or in this case, uh, we're going from A minor first, and then we're going to D minor, so up a fourth. Uh, and that kind of becomes a tune into itself. So I'm going to play the pattern I wrote, uh, it goes, and then I might just break away and start playing over it, because it's basically another great way of playing one to five chords. <laughs> hard <laughs> and then I move it up forgive me this new read is starting to give out uh, but shout out to these are excellent reads I've sort of started using these uh, over my Van Doren options uh, on alto at least these are a Boston sax shop uh, reads that I really like on alto I think they're made from Rigotti cane um, but there's something about the cut uh, that is great, and they tend to play really well right out of the box. Uh, on all my other horns, clarinets, and things, I use Van Doren primarily, but this, these have been great. Um, so if I take that kind of sound and then start to break away from it... I'm moving through the different keys and I'm just using it to spark my own creativity obviously some of that is maybe from the Bach that I'm looking at some of it is not uh, and that's the idea I, I'm not a mechanical improviser I hope and I'm not a mechanical uh, practicer in a lot of ways sometimes on the doubles I am it's nice and satisfying to just read through a bunch of scale patterns or something on flute or on a uh, clarinet because I just have so much work to do technically on those horns that it's not even about like improvising or hearing things as much. Um, but on, on the saxophone where I'm a little more comfortable, I like to break away from these pretty soon and start to do some improvising. Uh, so I advocate that you do something similar. Um, so uh, these are just some of the ideas. And this is all from literally eight lines maybe of the A minor flute partita. And I have, you know, chunks and chunks of material that you can play around with and there's more uh, there's another pattern at the bottom 
Uh, I mentioned that he moves in fourths and fifths a lot, uh, not only diatonically like that autumn leaf type of example, but also in dominant chord. And that's in the first page of this piece too. Really cool, it's just third and uh, it's like tritones moving down. And he's just following the circle of fifths. And there's a lot more cool ones written just as is from Bach, uh, from my bobblehead here, um, uh, that you can see uh, in his music and you can adapt and use them in rhythm changes. Obviously, it would be the obvious choice, but there's plenty of places where you see that types of motion in jazz. Um, or in the current on the bottom of the page, there's what I call a pivot type pattern. I studied with uh, Greg Osby way back when, and he would talk about pivot patterns where you keep coming back to a little cell of two or three notes. Uh, in this case, it's three or four. So I have that middle section where I'm playing C to B. Etc. And those can be really fun to get even more creative with because it's not also just about playing on tunes. These are things you can use in free playing, uh, just as shapes, basic musical shapes. So Osby would talk about using it on uh, symmetric diminished and more out kind of harmonies. So you just keep coming back to, say, uh, A symmetric, half whole symmetric diminished. I'll keep coming back to the A and the B flat. <laughs> etc and it kind of gives you this little pivot point where everything kind of rotates around that and Bach does that all over the place so if you want to do it in a more diatonic setting do that um, so that's a bunch of stuff and I've done a similar thing with the Toccata and Fugue uh, which is the da -da -da, da -da 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 for organ there's all these diminished patterns in there too um, it's just another thing to practice I, I like when I look for things to practice for creative solutions um, and since I figured I was listening to a lot of Bach and enjoying performing a lot of Bach, and again, you can see links to all of that stuff. I think there's on my YouTube channel or on uh, YouTube, if you look up the Luce Trio, especially L-U-C-E Trio, uh, you can see a performance we did on um, the radio a few years ago where we do uh, Bach Symphonia and we do uh, some other pieces, a chorale. Uh, and also, if you're just into Bach in general, it was his birthday last week. So um, tomorrow, they are doing the St. John Passion Live from Leipzig from Bach's church. They're doing a live stream of that. I'm not sure if they're all going to be in a room together. I'm not really sure what the plan is. But that's at 3 p.m. German time, I think. So something like 9 a.m. here in the East Coast. You can see the whole St. John Passion performed on its uh, liturgical day on Good Friday, uh, which is always a powerful thing to see. And I'm no, I should say, I'm no Bach expert. I read a lot about him. I have a bobblehead. <laughs> but this is more about me finding something unique to uh, bring to my woodwind practice. Uh, and I thought of this a few years back, so it's just been a really enjoyable thing for me to flesh out. So over the next weeks, we'll see how far we're on lockdown here. Uh, I hope to keep working on material for the new book. So I'd like to take any questions, if you guys have any. Um, that's that's my piece to say. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. Here we go. I just come down there. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay, so I don't know if you can hear me as well through this microphone. Flute. Alto sax. Yes, great. So you're familiar with the partitas. I like the violin partitas. This is to Sabine. Uh, the violin partitas more than the cello suites in some ways, or at least I like playing them more, and I think a lot of people feel that way. The cello suites are great, and I've taken some f patterns from there as well. Uh, but violin partitas just seem to have a lot that's relevant to us as saxophone players. Um, okay, so Marco, what you're saying about chord progressions. Yeah, if you have this handout that I just posted, you notice that if I thought it was relevant... 
um, I put in chord progressions. So I'm going to have a whole section. And if you're more interested in that in general, look at the Paul Desmond articles I did where I found some specific places where he's playing over. One of the examples that I like the most that got me into this whole thing was uh, his version of Gone with the Wind, which is early Brubeck, I think the second album or third album of the quartet. Uh, and they play Gone with the Wind, and he really outlines these beautiful Bach-type patterns, and I transcribed them, and they're on my website. The, I think the audio links may be broken at this point because uh, they got, you know, they were illegal. Uh, so I, I have to re-upload those, but you can find them on YouTube anyway. Uh, so Desmond certainly had ways of getting around specific chord progressions. So I will have sec whole sections on chord progressions. When it's just a diatonic pattern, it's not like there's no chord progression. Like, so I, I wrote on this diatonic pattern for myself, uh, this one that goes like this. I wrote C, A minor, D minor, B, E minor, C, and that may be important, it may not be. Uh, but yeah, when it's, when it's definitely significant, I will include it. So good idea. Thank you. Alex put the links. One more time, share the video, and uh, you will get the thing. So, Alex, question, do you practice in other cycles, like minor or major thirds? You know, I haven't even thought of that, <laughs> to be honest. It's so much. I, I always end up with way too much material, even doing it. I mean, even chromatically was a new thing, and doing it diatonically, too, is another new thing. Um, but doing it in minor and major thirds sounds like a great idea. Obviously, that's going to take us out of the key right away, which chromatically will do, too. Um, so how would that work? But yeah, and then I move it up to C. Or things like that, or even the diatonic ones, yeah. So I, this is good. I, I'm actually going to, and if you have a chance, um, send me a note through my website. I'd appreciate it, and I'll keep you in mind because I would like to send out a survey of things people would like to see in the book because I have a lot of raw materials and there's a million different ways I could present it. So if you have ideas of, like somebody gave me the idea of uh, carrying these into the altissimo range as at least an option, because pre-hearing your intervals in altissimo is so important. So these are nice musical shapes to try and work up to extend your range. So please keep the ideas coming. Uh, these are great. I will jot those down. Minor, major, thirds, good one. I mean, when it comes to scale patterns, you can really do a million different things. And I encourage you with the first book, since it doesn't do that for you, to try it with all of the patterns in the first book. Any other questions? I'm just looking, um, if I can find it, I'll play you one of the uh, etudes that I wrote for the book. In the meantime, maybe we'll finish with that. Uh, but please keep the questions coming. Just because um, you can easily get too mechanical. and some, One of the etudes I wrote is mechanical on purpose. It really just uh, plays through the chords, every note. But eventually, you want to get more musical than that and leave space. So here is one I wrote on a tune called How Deep is the Ocean? And I couldn't help myself. It's years of growing up with cheesy Abrasold titles, but I did a lot of pun titles for the tune. So this one is 20,000 Fugues. You know, how deep. All right. Um, and I'll, I haven't played this in a while, but I'll try and read it for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> 
don't know if you can hear the chords against that, uh, the original tune. And then just to put that against the first part of this. So I'm playing what I would play improvisationally, but also trying to work in some of the Bach material, but in an organic way. Hopefully that is helpful. So, uh, oh, hey, Ollie. Great. When dealing with these diatonic shapes, what do you suggest regarding direction? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of them do not work um, in two directions. You'd have to change them, invert them, or things, because a lot of times there's one irregular interval at the end of a shape that carries you into the next scale degree. So what I might do, because it is satisfying to go up and down when you play a scale pattern. So in the first book, everything just either goes up or either goes down. Um, so what I might start doing is combining, uh, just to make it a more satisfying exercise, uh, where I give you one shape going up. And I've already done that on a couple. There's a, I have my stack of new, new stuff, not shared with the public here, uh, where I took like, Mm, this pattern going up or going no where is it here we go this pattern going up and then going down I changed it to now that's a shorter pattern that's two or three notes so it's not as um, uh, hard to do that with the longer patterns some of them are just going to work one or two ways but I'm going to be doing a lot more options as far as which directions to move. With the current patterns, I would see what you can do as far as changing the shape to reverse direction. You'd have to do some thinking on that. Or try it the way it is, but it, some of them just do not work. You'll end up, it's like you're a machine that's stuck because there's a part of it that won't let you go down now. <laughs> you're on that level that will not move down. Uh, and just to answer Alex as far as how to reach me, it's all on my website. Uh, please do like my music page. Um, which is John De Lucia Music here on Facebook, but you can also s visit, I don't know if these links are visible, uh, johndelucia.com, where there's a shop which has uh, charts for all the tunes off my last quartet album, which is the John De Lucia group, As the River Sings. That was on Fresh Sound a couple of years ago. Um, you can get all the charts, which I painstakingly typed out uh, into Sibelius last year. Uh, those are there for sale. Uh, Bach duets are there for free. Um, the first book is there. The PDF is $15. The uh, physical book, which I am still mailing out because uh, I can still hand them off to the USPS truck, which I did yesterday. I mailed a couple more to Amazon. You can buy it on Amazon. It's obviously better if you buy it through my site. Uh, and that's it as far as getting in touch with me. You can email me through my site for lessons. I am getting used to this new world order and teaching a lot of Zoom lessons. Um, yeah, and thank you for, yeah, the new wonder is a new thing. I have my Mark VI sitting right over there, uh, but I've been playing a new wonder on tenor a lot, and I really liked it, so I got this one lovingly overhauled by Mario Scaramuzza. I don't think he's in here, uh, but he did a great job. And I picked up this horn. I paid $300 for this horn. Uh, it's gold-plated. It's gorgeous. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been great. And actually, the action and especially the low notes, low C, low B, feels so great on this horn. So it's very easy to play. <laughs> 